coming. You have come. A witness to the end of time. Bang. You're dead, Max Payne. I might have laughed if I remembered how. We gotta stop meeting like this. What are you waiting for? Circle around and kill him! Kill the cop! Pino ain't here, but he said bye. We've got the building surrounded. Throw down your weapons and lie down with your hands behind your head. The final gunshot was an exclamation mark to everything that had led to this point. I released my finger from the trigger. And the, the question of reopening is also on the minds of states. California was the first state to issue a stay-at-home order over the coronavirus, and now it is also... It's strange to think that at some point, we all thought 2020 would be a normal year. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience to see such a large, unified response to a global threat. We're going to look back at these times where we were strongly encouraged to stay indoors and avoid contact with other human beings in part because of what we did in our downtime. Video games have always been an excellent vehicle to distract, but they feel more important than ever in the midst of an international pandemic. There are plenty of good games out there to sink into, like a comfy chair. I could start another Factorio factory from scratch. That'd be pretty great. I could finally hook my Xbox 360 back up and play the explosive neon dream of Geometry Wars 2, the best Geometry Wars. But then I wondered, what game series better reflects on the weirdness of our modern times with precision action gameplay than the Max Payne trilogy? Noir thriller centered on themes of pain and loss, the Max Payne games pushed us through seedy criminal lairs, eccentric gangsters, and corrupt government plots one bullet at a time. I think he's dead already. As a teenager, I'd been following the development of Max Payne through the pages of PC Gamer magazine. The screenshots were crisp, featuring sharp textures and hurtling bullets in a post-Matrix era, inspired heavily by Hong Kong action films. To not just watch the slow-motion whiz-bang antics of bullet time, but use it as a central game mechanic was a game seller by itself. Years later, not even the licensed Matrix games could compete. Long before YouTube, it was easy to imagine the wishing of bullets or the roaring echo of slow motion in a dark and violent New York from the printed pages alone. The protagonist looked goofy, but he was graphically impressive at a time when 3D accelerators were still largely making their way into PCs. Max Payne released on the PC first in July 2001, still featuring the World Trade Center in its comic panels. It was a tragic reminder that would be altered for the Xbox and PS2 ports when they arrived that holiday. My computer wasn't hefty enough to handle the PC version, but my new Xbox console needed some solid games, so that's where I played it, with Duke controller in hand. It took a while before I realized that the game didn't look quite as sharp as the PC version, or that the levels had been chunked up into smaller sections to fit in the console's then impressive 64 megabytes of RAM, but none of that mattered. Max Payne was fun as hell. The story, told largely through Max Payne's internal monologue and comic panels, was quirky and dark, almost tongue-in-cheek. As exciting as Halo was, raining bullet hell on the crooked and the corrupt in slow motion was always thrilling. It didn't even need a multiplayer mode to extend its life. I played through it half a dozen times in that first year alone. With the help of Duke Nukem developer 3D Realms, the first Max Payne was originally slated to be published by Gathering of Developers, or G.O.D. G.O.D. was subsequently purchased by Take-Two, who placed Max Payne under their Rockstar banner in a pre-Grand Theft Auto 3 world. Right as the Xbox and PS2 ports of the game were released, Take-Two announced that they had bought the Max Payne IP from Finnish developer Remedy, then commissioned them to make the sequel, giving the developer an $8 million advance. As much as I loved Max Payne, its sequel snuck up on me when it came out in 2003. Max Payne 2, The Fall of Max Payne, looked sharper, with textures you could actually read, and both the bullet time and the shoot dodging were refined. But the fresh weirdness of the first game was traded in for darker shades. Max Payne 2 spent a lot of energy revisiting and expanding the first game in a way that felt a lot like fan service. I've played it once all the way through, and that was it. Despite not enjoying the sequel's heavy-handedness, these two games made me a fan of Remedy, a group that rose out of the 90s demo scene and would go on to develop the complex universes of Alan Wake, Quantum Break, and Control. The company has been driven creatively by writer Sam Lake, who served as the model for the original Max Payne. I've said plenty about Quantum Break, so be sure to check out my review for that as well. Max Payne 2 didn't sell great, and for a long time it seems the franchise was done. Remedy had moved on, and a middling movie starring Mark Wahlberg and Mila Kunis turned up in 2008 based loosely on the first game. It failed critically and commercially, and that was it. But the following year, Rockstar announced Max Payne 3 with a winter 2009 release date. In an expansive reveal in Game Informer, 
Rockstar presented a bald and bearded Max Payne caked in dried blood amidst the favelas of Sao Paulo. But to say it struck a nerve would be an understatement. In my mind, Rockstar would need an elaborate reason to explain how they pulled our brooding hero from the well-established high-contrast New York setting and plopped him down in a citrus-colored tropical paradise. Max Payne 3 took three years longer to release than I think anyone expected, but when my shift ended on launch day, I was down at Walmart snapping up my copy for the Xbox 360. They even threw in a digital copy of the original game, so that was nice of them. For Rockstar, Max Payne 3 was a 10 pull May release, coming the year after L.A. Noir and the year before Grand Theft Auto V, which came the year before them not releasing any games at all for a good long while. As a washed out alcoholic, Max is now serving as private security for a rich Brazilian family. While Max Payne 3 seemed to utilize every color in the rainbow visually, it was by far the darkest of the trilogy. The violence and subject matter had been converted from somewhat comical to grim. Grim as in, take a shower after playing this grim. Rockstar fundamentally changed the series' gameplay, adding a cover mechanic and altering how bullet time worked. Rockstar also continued the series' technical excellence by featuring incredible graphics and physics with elaborate set pieces. Max Payne 3 was an incredible, expensive accomplishment in its own right, but an odd fit as a sequel to the Remedy games. It also underperformed commercially, and since money makes the world go round, the series hasn't been heard from since. Over the years, I've somehow accumulated all three games on Steam, and since the PC is the best place to play them, when I'd previously played them all on Xboxes, I figured, what the hell? Why not? Trading my controller for a mouse and keyboard would be a novel way to play these games. It took a little tweaking with user-made patches to get Max Payne and Max Payne 2 working relatively bug-free and displaying properly on my modern 16.9 monitor, but that was relatively painless. The first game in particular, however, had some major issues with the camera in enclosed spaces throughout my time playing it again, forcing me to stare at random walls instead of the people shooting at me. I couldn't find anyone else with this problem, so I just had to deal with it. I've had numerous false starts of each game, but it's been 18 years since I've played the first game all the way through, 17 years for the second, and 8 years for the third. A while back I did Star Wars and Star Trek movie marathons, back when there were only 6 and 10 films respectively, and you get a novel perspective from seeing all of the products of a franchise in a row. The comparisons were immediate, allowing me to properly appreciate what I didn't like before, and acknowledge that some of my favorite parts were probably enhanced by nostalgia. Years of character development is shrunk into days and hours. Playing the Max Payne trilogy in a similar fashion brings out the same results, and it's great to be able to report my findings and enjoy the surprises. With all that said, let's dive in. Be able to override the system if I could just get to the server room. What's going on? Nothing to worry about. Everything's fine. Get down behind the desk now, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Put simply, the Max Payne games are third-person action shooters that are all about discharging your weaponry in creative ways. You have access to a large inventory of guns, but to perpetuate the myth of Max Payne as a one-man force of justice who can mow down thousands of enemies, you need bullet time. By activating bullet time, you can slow time temporarily to dodge and dispatch groups of enemies or kill foes that are overwhelmingly powerful when playing in real time. You also have the ability to dive while in bullet time, a move called shoot dodging that turns you into a fast moving target and hopefully places you behind cover in the end. Plus it looks fancy. Bullet time is such an important mechanic that it's mapped to the right mouse button, except in the third game which we'll talk about a little bit later. Like any action game, your enemy encounters are typically grouped into a series of brief minute long loops. Max Payne has one minute of fun it repeats over and over, but each game's combat puzzle works a little differently. In the first game, your bullet time drains quickly when in use. You fill your meter as you kill enemies, something that carries through all three games. Once you enter bullet time, you can usually kill two or three enemies, something the game usually sets you up with, before you run out. Unfortunately, in bigger encounters, this leaves you out in the open with whoever's left in real time, which actually looks a little goofy in a game like this. In real time, it's a frantic race to kill another enemy to get just a little bit more bullet time to be able to use bullet time again. Since Max doesn't give you a heads up about what a good amount of space to shoot dodge is in before you do it, it's very possible for you to shoot dodge into nearby walls, which also looks incredibly goofy. This typically happened when I panicked at the sound of a random gunshot, which was more often than I'd like to admit. Finishing off the last enemy in a group results in a really cool whip 360 degree camera pan indicating that the area is safe. If I have an actual gripe with the combat mechanics of the first Max Payne, it has to do with the shoot dodging. Like I said earlier, bullet time is mapped to the right mouse button and it's obviously an important feature. But here's the thing. 
If you activate bullet time while you are moving in any direction at all, Max Payne will automatically dive into a shoot dodge. Always, always, always. If I just want to step out into a hallway and ice a few dudes, I need to stand perfectly still before activating bullet time. Adding to the irritation is the fact that recovering from a dive leaves you extremely vulnerable and unable to return fire. These are all extremely annoying things that took a while to get over, but they're fixed in the second game. Now don't get me wrong, Max Payne is an incredibly fun game that requires you to stop sometimes and figure out the best way to breach a room or take down a group of gangsters. But with a few changes, Max Payne 2 improves the gunplay threefold easily. The first thing Remedy did was make your bullet time gauge slowly refill in perpetuity. This means that it's usually full and ready to go with each encounter, and you're not scrapping around trying to kill people in real time just to get a little bit of bullet time back. This means that the game can throw larger crowds for you to control without you being overwhelmed. The second change is that as you combo kills and your bullet time streak grows longer, your meter becomes yellow and time slows down even further, granting you even greater control over dispatching enemies and really allowing you to jump in the middle of the action. This is not only an incredible experience, but it gives you the greatest opportunity to make sure your enemies end up dead. Thirdly, when your meter is yellow and your weapon needs to reload, you're not going to be stuck there slowly reloading your gun until, most likely, your bullet time meter runs out and you're back to reality. No, no, no. When you need to reload in this mode, Max Payne twirls around and reloads his weapon instantly so you can continue the streak. Finally, just as I mentioned, entering bullet time while moving in a direction no longer forces a shoot dodge dive, which means you can control the situation even further. If you need to shoot dodge, however, it's more useful here because you can continue firing while you're still on the ground. I rarely ever used it though. To show you how all of these elements work together, let's bring up the fight with Kaufman. Now I don't know who Kaufman is, I guess he's the leader of these villainous cleaning guys. But it doesn't matter because they're all going to end up dead. Okay, getting close here. There's an active reload. There's an active reload. Bam, there's another active reload. And pow, the encounter is complete. Seven people down in one streak, including a mini boss. So before I get into the gunplay of Rockstar's third game, I need to cover a few other things. Health is handled with painkillers, somewhat prophesizing the opioid crisis to come. They're strewn about in all of these games, they even have a cool outline in the third, but they typically hide out in special cabinets that also exist in all three games. The only difference is that you need to actually open the cabinets in the first game, adding a wholly unnecessary step to the process. Nitpicky, I know. In the Remedy games, your health will actually recharge to a point around the collarbone on the figure that allows you to still take a few hits before you're dead. This is a lifesaver in the first game, despite Max's annoying limp at this level of health, but it almost nullifies the point of painkillers in the second game. If you take your time and solve each combat puzzle individually, you may never need to heal. I found that painkillers usually just gave me an excuse to be sloppy, and I was in the near-fatal health range for a lot of the game anyway. In the third game, your health doesn't recharge at all, so you need to be very careful. By the way, the first game has the best sound when you pick these pill bottles up. Then there's the guns. They come in a variety of shapes, sizes, firing rates, and capabilities, and these games are littered with them. Pistols are actually great for headshots in the third game, but there are plenty of automatic weapons and shotguns too. You don't get grenades and molotovs in the third game, but you do get a grenade launcher toward the end that is incredibly fun, for obvious reasons. In the Remedy games, you're holding on to all of your weaponry at once. That means if you've run out of ammo for one gun, you're probably stocked up on ammo for another gun, or two, or three, that you've been picking up as you've been playing. Like many PC action games from this era, the best gun in these first two Max Paynes is the Quick Save. Despite existing alongside the checkpoint-friendly Halo, saves must be made pretty explicitly or you'll lose a lot of time, like the very first 15 minutes of the first game, unskippable introductory cutscene and all, that I had to run through yet again when I forgot to save my game. F5, 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 people! Max Payne 3 spares you most of the drama by implementing checkpoints, but there were still several lengthy firefights that place checkpoints a little too far away that quickly become a are-you-kidding-me moment when you bite the dust. So let's talk about the third game. 
First off, you're carrying a couple guns at a time. If you pick up a rifle, Max can carry it in his free hand, which is physically represented in the game. Pretty rad. This can lead to some tough scrapes though. Yes, it's unrealistic to carry around 11 guns at once, along with grenades and molotovs, but it also led to a few moments where, during a firefight, I actually ran out of ammo. This is made even more frustrating by the fact that the game doesn't automatically switch you to the next weapon when you run out of what you're using. Rockstar decided that Max Payne 3 should be a deluxe affair and the combat is a clear example. You see, in the Remedy games, if you're not using the primary bullet time mechanic, you're trying to handle enemies in real time and that's a great way to end up dead fast. Rockstar probably thought that was a very narrow way to handle combat by the turn of the decade, so they added a cover system. This is chest high walls, yes, but it's also pillars and doorways and the edges of buildings, so on, the usual. Of course, a lot of this cover can be destroyed, or at least made to look like it's destroyed, meaning you'll need to keep moving to stay safe. In Max Payne 3, the right mouse button doesn't activate bullet time, that's the left shift key. Instead, it brings you into a focused, slightly zoomed in mode to aim easier. It's kinda iron sights. With a mouse, this makes headshots abundant, and since all of the enemies are the same height, it's usually a matter of swishing left and right to take down a group at once. So what do you do with bullet time when you have systems like that? Nothing special, really. Max Payne 3's combat is calibrated around larger battle arenas in which the enemy also has cover. It's just not practical to recreate the up-close, dive-into-it gunplay of the second or sometimes the first game. Instead, bullet time, which also doesn't refill in this game, serves as more of a crutch, like an aim assist. This is helpful when the crowds get large or come flanking you, which will absolutely happen in this game. This also renders shoot dodging largely useless, although it happens automatically in the last stand mode, which is something unique to this game. If you're near death with a painkiller still on you, you can, Borderlands style, kill an enemy to pop back to life with improved health. One helpful bit that Rockstar did with bullet time was make the bullet paths stand out more so they're easier to avoid. This brings me to the couple extra wrinkles Rockstar includes here with scripted sequences. Max Payne 3 features a number of slides in which you take down a bunch of people while moving along a linear surface. But then there are the more dramatic dives, which I counted 10 or so, and included 9 here for symmetry, in which you automatically enter bullet time to knock out as many people as you can before the dive concludes. It's cinematic, which is Rockstar's way. It's also much easier with a mouse. Combat in this game feels like using a Swiss Army knife, and playing through these games like this, I can't really blame Rockstar for chasing this philosophy. In the Remedy games, Max Payne is a badass in bullet time, but a vulnerable guy otherwise. In this game, he's a badass in bullet time, he's badass in cover, he's badass leaping off a roof, he's badass with a big gun on a cigar boat, he's badass doing this and that. To be honest though, in completing this game I was particularly fatigued of how Rockstar had built the combat system when I hadn't in the first two games. Clicking into cover, popping up, and making headshot after headshot became tedious because it was the most effective way of killing people and nothing else came close. The shooting gallery approach of the game worked, enemies pop in and out like targets at a carnage game, but it wasn't nearly as dynamic as being able to leap out into the open and use your damn superpowers like it was in the Remedy games. Each Max Payne game was a technical marvel upon release. Remedy is a developer with impressive technical chops, demonstrated all the way back to those first magazine spreads for Max Payne. The Remedy games featured award-winning graphics alongside their innovative gameplay, but Rockstar has a reputation for investing a lot of time and money toward R&D as well. They've been dedicated to plenty of more than glitz technologies like Natural Emotion's Euphoria animation system that blends animations together, allowing people to move realistically. Max Payne 3 takes a little getting used to coming off the Remedy games, because Rockstar's Max doesn't come to an immediate halt when you let off the movement keys. Where Rockstar had a strong advantage making their game comes in the budget. Rockstar spent nearly 10 times as much making Max Payne 3 than Remedy did on both of their games combined, and it shows. Every frame is crammed with millions of gorgeous pixels and independent systems doing their thing. Motion captured actors and bit roles populate the world doing things like playing soccer in the background. And the game can handle all of this without a hitch with Rockstar's Rage Engine, which powers everything else they make. Well, small note, there's actually this hitch where an invisible officer De Silva picks up Max after a firefight. 
and then the whole world slowly pops into existence. To be fair, this is the only time I saw it happen. Understandably, the Remedy games, and definitely the first game, haven't aged well graphically. But they're also titles that emerged during the second generation of 3D consoles. These games landed earlier on the curve of graphic fidelity, while Max Payne 3, eight years later, is still absolutely gorgeous. Barring all the superfluous flares and color separation visual effects, these levels look incredible. The favelas are beautiful, and so is running around Daphne's boat in Panama, or the nightclub that gets rocked early in the game. I actually had flashbacks to Deus Ex Human Revolution, which released the year before, and had incredible level dressing and artwork throughout. While in Panama, you shoot your way through a museum about the canal. Unfortunately, you can't read anything on the plaques, which is okay because it's in Spanish and I couldn't read it anyway. As beautiful as Max Payne 3 is, it does have some weird assets from time to time, like this really chunky whiteboard drawing, or some less than stellar clothing textures. But then you hop into something mundane like an elevator and there's really nice textures in there. I don't get it. Max Payne 3 also portrays violence incredibly well. As you get injured, moist bloody bullet holes appear on your clothing, while putting holes in your enemies results in some really nasty gore, especially when it comes to headshots, which is a visceral metric of your progress. The AI of the Remedy games never really seemed like anything special. It does exactly what it needs to do. Enemies and their limited pathfinding feel largely scripted. Enemies that are hidden behind cover typically stay in their posted spot. Enemies that charge you usually do so along the same lines. This creates situations, for better and worse, where you can execute the same series of moves to solve a combat puzzle like a rhythm game. When you get to improvise, it's better in the second game where you usually have ample bullet time. In the third game, combat is a little different. Enemies will usually find ways to flank you from every angle, even above and below. Even playing on easy, it's still very easy for you to die if you're not paying attention. When you're not playing with guns, you're typically scrubbing each level for details, ammo, and painkillers. In the first game, you have little story inserts that provide extra narrative detail and breakout comic panels. The levels are basic enough that objects are rarely obfuscated, but the second, and then definitely the third games are loaded with detail, leading to a lot of wall rubbing to make sure I have everything. Max Payne 3 is also littered with collectibles like evidence or the golden gun parts. You see, each one of your weapons has three golden components somewhere in the game. Get all three and you get a gold version of that weapon with some better stats. And it looks pretty. The other big technical aspect here is physics. Max Payne 3 is one of the first games to feature Havoc physics, which is a really popular middleware. The game flaunts this by having you run through stacks of boxes and making deaths look particularly fun, sometimes as if they're sitting down. Dead enemies typically float away like ragdoll balloons and while it's technically dated, it's always fun to watch. The third game takes this further, of course. Tied in with the Euphoria engine, crumpling humans look very realistic. It also hands a hand in making the destructible cover more believable, too. Neither game, however, uses physics to do anything emergent or revolutionary. There won't be any shooting down ledges to collapse on enemies, no gravity gun like antics, obviously. But in my mind, there's a dream scenario where you could cause enough damage in some future Max Payne game to cause red faction levels of damage that could be used as weaponry. There are environments in Max Payne 3, like the airport terminal at the end, that could really benefit from an explosive makeover. While playing it for this review, Max Payne 3 suffered from a few soft crashes, but the game's handful of quick time events became the real showstoppers. To disarm one bad guy in a burning building, the game commanded that I click the right mouse button within a specific window of time. Clicking the button didn't work, even though it functioned the rest of the game, so I died several times trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. The prompt even subtly indicates that you have to click the right and middle buttons. It didn't matter. I clicked all kinds of buttons and nothing seemed to work. I googled solutions and nothing came up. In an unexplainable fluke involving the main menu, I managed to disarm the guy, but the next time it happened, I couldn't reproduce what I'd done. I genuinely thought this would be the end of my time with the game. The solution? I had an Xbox One controller hooked up and the game has great native controller support. Tapping the controller's buttons in the game switched the prompts to controller options and I was able to get through the encounter with the controller before seamlessly switching back to keyboard and mouse. Okay, now it's time to get weird. This is Deputy Chief Jim Bravora from the NYPD. You are to cease your criminal activities and surrender immediately. Sure thing, Jim. Me and the boys have been talking and everyone's real sorry. They'll never do it again. Who the hell is this? Spanning three games, the Max Payne story is a dark and twisted tale of cruelty and revenge, with a morally conflicted White Knight protagonist at its core. Each game has a different emotional locus. In the first game, it's the loss of Max's wife and baby daughter. In the second, it's assassin slash love interest Mona Sachs. 
and in the third, it's himself. The first game, a title from a scrappy developer without a big budget, relies on telling its story through comic panels populated by whoever they could get in costumes and in front of a camera. The model's antics in these panels contribute to the game's tongue-in-cheek tone, which, at one point, has Max Payne dreaming that he's in a computer game. I was in a computer game. Funny as hell, it was the most horrible thing I could think of. The central antagonist, the Acer CEO Nicole Horn, is actually modeled in the game by Sam Lake's mother. TV shows play throughout the game that you can keep up with. Address Unknown is a Lynchian horror fest about psychotic people. I have no idea what that means. Lords and Ladies is an award-winning costume drama, and Captain Baseball Bat Boy is a cartoon co-starring by Skull Helmet Girl, who is definitely not his girlfriend. Yeah, She's not my girlfriend! For the darker second game, the silliness and eccentricity is dialed down a bit, which I think sold off some of the game's charm. It's not that the fun-loving good times of the first game were ditched entirely, they find their way into an expanded set of in-game TV shows and environmental storytelling that gets extremely meta. He's been playing those video games an awful lot. Makes him a very good shooter. Holding that controller's like holding a gun, they say in the news. Along with all of the first game's programming featuring Sam Lake in a variety of costumes, we get Dick Justice, who is also Sam Lake in a wig, in a reference to Dark Justice, the original name of the series. With graphics technology advancing as quickly as it was at the time, adding the important ability to animate faces, the role of storytelling was largely shifted from comic panels to in-game cinematics. The third game tries to meld the two approaches of comic panel and real-time cinematics, telling its story exclusively in-game, but literally framed into panels with flashy optical effects while arbitrary words pop up on screen, sometimes in weird locations. And then there are times when the panels make no sense, like framing the back of Max's head here. It's a style largely inspired by Tony Scott's 2004 film Man on Fire, so it's not that hard to imagine Rockstar's creative lead Dan Hauser tried to combine that movie's frenetic visual pacing and Remedy's Man with Nothing to Lose action franchise. Rockstar's approach largely works, but it's indulgent to a fault, which I suppose is their trademark. Rockstar also features a few of the TV series from the first game, some bundled with news reports, and these are very well produced. The problem is that they don't fit very well in this grimdark universe they've created. So now I want to break down the arcs of each game. Following Max on his twisted journey through these games is why we press on, exchanging bullets for victory. I finished the first and third games in just over 7 hours, while the second game was only 6. Max Payne is a story consisting of 22 chapters divided into 3 acts with 3 prologues. It takes place in the dead of winter, which I love, because I enjoy wintry scenes in any game. But in retrospect, it probably matched the December weather when the Xbox port released. Max doesn't seem to have an issue with the cold and occasional flurry, but the less fortunate do. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I don't feel fine. I don't feel anything. Not a thing. This doesn't have any effect on gameplay whatsoever, but it does cast a sense of hostility on the environment. I can't seem to find it in my notes, in the footage, or online, but I believe Max does note that the storm keeps people off the streets to avoid the violence. So back to the story. Act 1 begins as NYPD officer Max Payne comes home to find his home being invaded. Despite killing the Valkyrie addicted invaders, he comes too late to save his wife and daughter. Three years later, Max has joined the DEA, and when coming to meet his old pal Alex, Alex is killed by a character off screen. Max is framed for the murder and now being pursued by the NYPD. With nothing to lose, he begins a violent vigilante campaign to destroy the Punchinello mob family's chain of command on his way to Don Punchinello's right-hand man, Jack Lapino, who Max believes put the hit on his family. They all have to go. The Finito brothers, Rico Muerte, Vinny Gogniti, kinda. After plowing through the Punchinello slums and rancid institutions, Max winds up at the Ragnarok nightclub where he encounters Jack Lapino, high on both Valkyr and the occult, and absolutely insane. Max then meets mysterious assassin Mona Sachs, the evil twin sister of Lisa Punchinello, wife of Don Punchinello, who promptly slips him a Mickey, which begins the second act. So I'm easy, as long as you don't try to slip me a Mickey. While this dream sequence maze that serves as Act 2's prologue plays, I want to make a point about the tone and the characters of this game. You can only take this game so seriously, which is kind of the point. You see it in the goofy posing of the comic panels, amateur models, you hear it in the dialogue. Sam Lake sews the script with endless metaphors and flowery prose that escapes ridicule by being clever in its silliness. The whole game is a triple-A effort to make a B-movie. 
It feels like a stage production loosely based on the actual events of Max Payne, who sits behind the camera as an advisor watching the game come together. These first two games, both explicitly and without even trying, become meta in their commentary about themselves. The TV shows you watch in the game's world are really just reduced versions of what you're actually playing in. These characters are not only characters, but also functional cogs in the narrative of the Max Payne murder machine. As a result, they're some of the most memorable characters in a video game. We're now at the universally despised trail of blood and you don't need to watch me fumble through it. I used to have it memorized. Let's get going to the experimental chapters of Act 2. Max wakes in a familiar basement with Punchinello hitman Frankie the Bat Niagara and naturally has to say something stupid. Niagara, as in you cry a lot? He had a baseball bat and I was tied to a chair. Pissing him off was the smart thing to do. Frankie leaves for the bar to finish you off later, but Max has other plans. In the game's sole stealth section, Max is left with only a baseball bat while facing off against a literally rotating patrol of armed goons in a concrete basement loop. I'm glad they mixed up the gameplay a bit here, but this feels like a crude afterthought in an age where Metal Gear Solid and Thief had elevated stealth mechanics immensely. Oh well. Max battles his way back to Jack Lupino's hotel to take Frankie down in the bar's second big gunfight of the evening, with police tape still hanging from the door frames. You glimpsed him briefly earlier, but this is the point where the game introduces Russian mob boss Vladimir Lem. In exchange for taking down his defecting lieutenant Boris Dime, now on the Punchinello's payroll, and retaking Vlad's boat, he offers Max some of the fancy military hardware on board and help whenever he needs it. Max battles through the shipyard, which includes an undercooked sniping section, and boards the Chiron, killing Dime. Max makes a desperate plea to meet Don Pinchinello, and they agree to meet at his restaurant. The restaurant spontaneously combusts, providing a level in which Max needs to navigate a path through and out of the firestorm, or he'll die. And he'll die a lot. A lot a lot. Max gets out, of course, but not without uttering my favorite line in the entire series. The mobsters have been guarding a real treasure. The way out of this disco inferno. Max reaches the Punchinello Manor and battles to a small army of goons to reach Don Punchinello himself. Suddenly, the game's villain appears, Nicole Thorne, with her own private army to take down Punchinello first and stick Max with a big old dose of Valkyr second, which begins the dream sequence that starts the third act. Max battles through Horn's foundry to discover that Valkyr was a failed super soldier serum that drove its patients mad. Horn then sold it illegally as a designer drug through the Punchinello family, which built the Acer success story. Max discovers that his wife and child were targeted by Horn because files on the super soldier serum were accidentally sent to the district attorney's office where his wife worked. Also, there's a secretive inner circle led by Alfred Woden who wants Horn dead, but Horn murders them first. After fighting his way out, Max caps the crooked cop who killed Alex way back when, then makes his way to Acer where Mona is probably killed. He takes out Horn and her helicopter with a sniper rifle, bringing us back to the beginning of the game where Max is taken into custody. So now we have to discuss my least favorite part of Max Payne, the levels. Let me say that first, there are some solid examples here, don't get me wrong. But those 22 chapters, many of them are just broken down portions of bigger slices of the game. This means that there are several lengthy and repetitive sections of the game that are generally not that fun to battle through. Shooting through Lupino's Drab Hotel, then continuing through to Drab Dilapidated Apartments before heading back to that Drab Hotel a few chapters later is not fun. Snaking through an alternating set of warehouses and stacks of shipping containers on your way to the Chiron isn't thrilling. This isn't great either. Battling through two chapters of this was a chore. There are boxes and crates and containers everywhere. Being a small scrappy team at the time, I can't blame Remedy too much for needing to pad out the already short campaign a bit to increase the value proposition, but compared to its sequels, it feels skeletal in its variety. Finally, I don't think anyone can understand the first game's obsession with line walking. Whether it's along the edge of a gothic buttress, or it's hyper-controversial trails of blood, the game loves placing you on narrow strips of real estate where death is certain if you tap the keyboard or move the stick even slightly wrong. The third game has at least one of these sequences, but they lock you into that line, so all you have to do is push forward, removing all the stress of the event. Good save, Rockstar. Max Payne 2's story is 21 chapters broken into 3 acts with 3 prologues. Remedy's sequel starts in Medias Res in a hospital where our hero is in bad shape, stumbling around unarmed, having visions of Mona Sachs. The bad guys are here though, and before we get too far, we run into Police Chief Jim Bravura, Max's boss and the very man who led the effort to capture him in the first game. 
Alfred Woden got you out of a very long jail sentence following your campaign of death in the first game, but we later discovered that he was the one who sent the super soldier serum files to the DA's office to get your family murdered. Pardon my French, but stuff is going down in this first act. Going back a few days, Max Payne is investigating a group of cleaners, the Squeaky Clean Company, who seem to deal in gunfire-related sanitizing solutions. As in, they shoot lots of people and then clean it up. Max witnesses a woman being murdered before murdering everyone involved. Mona Sachs appears and then vanishes. From there you get to revisit Ragnarok Nightclub, but now under Vlad's ownership and reopening soon as Vodka, because duh. Now you're waking up in Max's apartment after a nightmare and Mona shows up, except now she has to leave because there's a sniper on the other side of the courtyard picking through the windows. And guess what? They've been there for weeks surveilling him. Max's apartment complex is another two chapter block that wears out its welcome, but it finishes with a swarm of cleaners that really let you exercise your bullet time skills. Plus this lady is really nice. Such a nice young man, coming to see an old lady like me. Just passing through, ma'am. Such a nice boy. Now you're off to find Mona at the closed Address Unknown theme park, a horrifying adventure land based on the show. It's easily the most creative level of the Remedy games. It's so great, in fact, that you get to come back two more times later in the game. Now you're going through executive apartments trying to find Mona's contact in the inner circle. Unfortunately, he's dead, and the squeaky clean team is here in force. Max and Mona take them down, of course. Act 2. We need to talk about Act 2. Max and Mona both wind up back at the cop shop, but he's in Bravura's office getting demoted to desk duty, and she's in a cell down in the basement. The two reunite just as the squeaky clean company arrives to wreck the place. Max escapes via the parking garage, and Vlad happens to be there to pick him up. Hmm. Vlad takes Max to the closed address unknown park where he meets with Mona, but before long the squeaky clean guys show up to wreck the place. Hmm. The duo take down the cleaners and Max manages to stow away in one of their escaping vans, bringing him back to their hideout. Okay, act two. Stop. We need to actually stop. Now. Now, I'm not sure if I have some kind of psychic antenna sending waves back in time to the Remedy team, but they seem to acknowledge the weakest parts of the first game, drab and repetitive levels and dilapidated and unfinished buildings that span multiple chapters. Well... They decided that the game needed just that at this point. Max arrives at the squeaky clean HQ and it's just that. It's been 17 years since I've played this section and I remember hating it. We are now in the depths of Max Payne 2's soggy middle act, the product of the least amount of imagination in a game that has otherwise proven how creative it is. Everything leading up to this point has been a relative blast with one unique setting after another. But here we are. And the Warehouse Nightmare doesn't span two chapters. It doesn't span three chapters. It spans five entire chapters, leading to the conclusion of Act 2. Five entire chapters that revolve around this dreadful complex killing cleaners and commandos alike. A year before Halo 2 would freak everyone out by letting you play as Keith David's Arbiter, Max Payne switches you to Mona Sachs for the latter three of these chapters, allowing you to understand events from her perspective, which is the most creative facet of this otherwise dreadful nugget of an experience. But to top all of this off, the final two chapters are, get this, an escort mission. Yes, I've said the cursed words out loud. An escort mission, the worst of all missions. As Max recovers from a fall trying to escape an exploding building, enemies begin creeping up on him. As Mona with a sniper rifle, or whatever weaponry you have in hand, you need to cover him. While Max moves to the exit, you have to move back through the complex, largely the way you came in, to continue providing that cover. 17 years later, I was happy that my mouse made killing easier than the right stick of my controller, so I could get through this woeful chunk of the game as quickly as possible. I haven't explained who Detective Winterson is at this point, and neither has the game, really, but Max kills her before she can kill Mona, and that's the end of that. Act 3 gets better, thank god. Starting with the prologue, this final section of Max Payne 2 uses a pair of dream sequences to reproduce events that happened in the real world, shrouding them with the surreal fog of the dream world. We're now back to the hospital with Max right where we left him at the beginning of the game, hovering over Detective Winterson's corpse. There's a commando on the other side of this door, and without a weapon, you are now playing a round of Memorize the Best Route to Avoid Getting Shot by Bad Guys. It's a level that mirrors Max's journey through the flames of Don Punchinello's restaurant in the first game. Until you get it just right, you're going to die a lot. Max gets a gun and applies the appropriate remedy to the hospital's ailments, 
then figures out that Vlad runs both the cleaners and the commandos and is trying to take command of the inner circle. Max heads to Ragnarok yet again to confront him. Sorry, I meant vodka. Look, I think it's fine and dandy that Remedy wanted to revisit a level from the first game and spruce it up. Graphics and budgets changed a lot between the two games, so it's neat to see what's basically a remastered chunk of the first game in the second one. But come on, this is now the third time I'm wandering through this club. I know this place like the back of my hand at this point. I'm thankful I'm not walking on the roof again, but come on! At any rate, it's time to find Vinny Gagne. Max begins by crashing through a remastered, shorter version of the first game's dilapidated slums. One trick that this game's level designers employ to both frustrating and interesting effect are layouts with dead ends and red herrings that disguise the game's otherwise linear course. As a design, it's actually pretty clever, but getting lost in a less than enjoyable level is still less than enjoyable. Soon, Max meets with Gogniti's men, and they begin a march down the street to his car dealership. Max finds Gogniti inside a giant Captain Baseball Bat Boy costume rigged with explosives, courtesy of Vladimir Lem. After another escort mission that ends with escaping in Vinny's van, the narrative splits off again, putting you in control of Mona as she visits the park yet again, but in flames. She finds Vinny's exploded costume, then confronts Vlad, who has just shot Max in the head for killing Winterson, who was romantically involved with Vlad. As he alluded to earlier, it's just not a plot thread that seemed to matter much. Mona revives Max and they make their way to Woden's Manor. Vlad is already there and has infiltrated the grounds with his vast paid army. Max and Mona work together and separately through the estate until she reveals she was hired by Woden to kill him and Vlad. She can't kill him, obviously, and in a moment of weakness, Vlad arrives and shoots her. Woden then emerges from his panic room in an attempt to stop Vlad, but ends up dead anyway. Max and Vlad fight, setting off an explosive that sends them to a basement loaded with more explosives. In what might have been a terrible disaster trying to finish the game, I quick saved with far too little time to escape the basement detonation. Thankfully, the game had automatically made a save at the beginning of the sequence, so I was able to roll back, thankfully. Max chases Vlad through the manor, at one point not realizing that there's a pane of bulletproof glass between them, ending with Vlad high in a balcony above him. It took me a few minutes to realize, or remember, that Max needs to shoot out the supports above Vlad, kind of an inverse of how Max killed Nicole Horn before. He's doing this pixel-precise shooting work while dodging Vlad's explosives, which are slowly degrading the floor that Max is standing on. There's two rounds of peg shooting required before you can shoot at Vlad directly, and then he's dead, falling toward the grandiose floor below, his corpse erupting in flames. With Vlad and Mona gone, the game ends with Max finding a faint sliver of hope. The credits roll to the song Late Goodbye by Finnish rock band Poets of the Fall, a tune that various characters sing throughout the game. The end promises that Max Payne's journey through the night is not done. But for a while, Max Payne's journey would indeed be done. Beyond the frustration of the game's second act, what really soured me on Max Payne 2 was Vlad's heel turn. The Russian provided sanctuary and resources to Max during a desperate time and was, as Max put it, Vladimir was one of those old-time bad guys with honor and morals, which made him almost one of the good guys. None of us was a saint. Vlad became a highlight of the first game for me. Yes, his work was nefarious, but there was something noble about it. It's understandable that Sam Lake would want to do something drastic with Vlad for the second game to give his character an arc and provide a strong central villain. Wealthy business people are the bad guys in these games, and the acquisition of wealth breeds a corrupt core, a loss of empathy, a lack of humanity. With Punchinella out of the picture, Vlad had plenty of room to expand his criminal empire between the two games, allowing the strangling arms of capitalism and greed in, and losing his soul in the process. A once noble man now burns to cinders in the palace of a king he couldn't dethrone. Finally, we have Max Payne 3. Before we dig into this grim sequel, I have to talk about the writing. Rockstar and Dan Hauser are known for their caustic stories with caustic and generally evil, or at least immoral, people. Rockstar games trade in highlighting the dark side of human nature and all the paraphernalia that goes along with it. Let's not forget that their most popular product, a game that has generated billions of dollars in revenue, is named after, and largely revolves around, a criminal act. These themes of lawlessness, disorder, and the moral ambiguity needed to stay afloat and thrive amongst the chaos is woven into all of Rockstar's games. Except table tennis, maybe. On paper, this makes Max Payne a perfect fit for the Rockstar stable of properties, and Dan Hauser, the creative lead who pens a lot of the studio's work, was perhaps the next best scripter to Sam Lake to give a new Max Payne a fitting voice. But Rockstar misses the point of making a Max Payne sequel by treating it like another Rockstar game and not the extension of this quirky noir series it needed to be. 
The writing, which would be fine for another Rockstar release or a theatrical crime drama, is a pale imitation of Sam Lake's style at best. It's functional. It gets you from A to B. It moves the plot along. It gets people killed. It gets a lot of people killed. Take, for example, this conversation that Marcelo Bronco has with Max Payne. Marcelo, a douche canoe and a half, is encouraging his private security to perk up and party. He calls Max Mikey and brags about partying in the Hamptons. Max discreetly slips that he and his wife honeymooned in Montauk. Oh, where's that? It's just down the road. Whatever. Last time I was there, I got so wasted. Marcelo doesn't understand this. He's operating on an entirely different wavelength than Max, where his greatest concerns are being rejected by women and running out of access. Marcelo doesn't understand the tragedy of Max's dead wife because he's surrounded by beautiful women. Max doesn't know how this kid grew up to be so vapid and is conversational with him just far enough to keep up appearances. It's a great little scene that highlights the uneasy relationship of these two characters. But it's not really Max Payne. Gone is the clever, almost poetic writing that really nailed Max's internal dialogue in a way that could only be told, not shown. That inner monologue is still the driving force of this game's narrative, but Hauser takes the Max Payne universe literally, like he does all of the universes he creatively lords over. When he does provide more elaborate prose, it's still blunt and unimaginative. There are only a handful of memorable lines in this entire game, and they're still not very creative. Instead, Max expressing himself involves shouting louder than he's ever shouted before, with more vulgarity than ever. You're insane, you sick fuck! Not that I'm a prude, but the vulgarity pervades the entire game. Of course this game introduces the first uses of racist slang in the series. Of course the good cop would randomly meet with Max in a strip club. Of course the Bronco's father died of a heart attack in a brothel. The violence is also sadistic, graphic, and extreme. The cutscenes are typically excessive in style and length. Time and time again, Max Payne 3 shows the work that it is indeed a Rockstar game and not a Remedy game. Max Payne 3 story is a complex yarn with a simple lineup of 14 chapters. There's thankfully only one case of chapter packaging similar to the Remedy games, the favelas portion, which is split by a flashback chapter. Otherwise, each chapter is its own unique location, time, and mood. The game spends two chapters explaining how Raul Passos arrives in New Jersey to find a washed up Max Payne milking his sorrows with alcohol in a less than stellar neighborhood of Hoboken, New Jersey. Passos serves as private security for the Broncos, a prominent Brazilian family, and seeks to recruit Max. Passos sells Max on the idea of rebooting his life and seeing the world while doing what he's best at, killing people. Surprise, surprise, Raul succeeds, but not before Max kills the local mob boss's son, which creates a mountain of hurt for him. Before departing, they visit the gravestone of Max's wife and daughter, which is promptly shot up by the mob boss's men. Raul and Max kill a large number of these guys before fleeing the country. So we have to slow down for a second and narrow down to a time that the game did hitch once. In this particular sequence, Raul is trying to get away and Max is covering for him. We come upon a group of mobsters by a car and Raul is unseen down the road. You can shoot them from this position all you want, get as many headshots as you'd like, but Raul still gets killed. After playing the sequence several times, I realized that the person who kills Raul in the cutscene doesn't actually exist in the scene. The only way to advance the segment, I discovered, is to dive into the crowd. That's not a great way to gate progress, guys. The Broncos are three brothers. Rodrigo is the oldest, a successful businessman he inherited the most from their parents. Victor is the middle child and a local politician. Marcelo is the youngest and, as we've already explored, is a club-hopping socialite idiot. Rodrigo is married to Fabiana, a much younger woman who spends most of her time partying with Marcelo. Now my wife, I am not naive. She does not love me for my buddy. Giovanna is Fabiana's sister, and the two are known for their charity work. You know, rich people things. Speaking of which, the game opens as Rodrigo is throwing a party benefiting charity at his penthouse. After the player is introduced to the key characters, members of the street gang Commando Sombra stream in, attempting to kidnap Fabiana. Max makes quick work of this effort, but they realize that the gang has taken Rodrigo. Max races to the basement where he saves him in the nick of time. A few days later, Max accompanies Marcelo, Fabiana, and Giovanna to a nightclub where Commando Sobra successfully kidnaps Fabiana, demanding a $3 million ransom, but not before we need to escort Giovanna around the roof of this nightclub with a sniper rifle. Rodrigo readies his wife's ransom, sending Max and Raul to handle the transaction at a major football stadium. The party is crashed by paramilitary group Crush Preto, 
who wipe out the Commando Sombra guys and take the ransom. Max and Roe will walk away empty handed. Max then crashes the old riverside docks that house Commando Sombra, and after an exhausting shootout up the River Tiete by land and boat, Fabiana slips through their fingers yet again. In his office, Rodrigo slumps into a depression just as Crasha Preto crashed the place in a spectacular fashion. After mowing down a ton of guys, and with the help of the staff IT guy, they manage to secure the building, then Rodrigo in his office. However, Max discovers that Rodrigo was murdered anyway, and look, there's a bomb. Max stumbles through the burning structure to discover Crasha Preto was actually there to kill him, not Rodrigo, which makes little sense for reasons we discover later. Now the game isn't split into discrete acts, but this is the point where you would need to swap DVDs in the Xbox 360 version. It's a very logical split, because this is when Max breaks down and shaves his head, becoming the initially reviled version of Max Payne that Rockstar unveiled in 2009. This is also the point in the game where we depart the bougie, highly maintained environments of the Broncos to plumb the depths of Sao Paulo's darker side through the favelas and on. After getting robbed, Max meets Officer De Silva who explains the plot so far. Max exacts his revenge on the guys who robbed him and makes his way to the Commando Sombra hideout only to discover that Marcelo and Giovanna tried to pay their own ransom sum for Fabiana and got captured instead. Max interrupts the meeting pleading for their lives, but Fabiana is killed. Marcelo and Giovanna are let out and eventually found by the UFA, Sao Paulo's police special forces. These are the same guys who executed a Commando Sobra thug in the parking garage basement after the Rodrigo kidnapping attempt. Max battles his way through them to discover that they're in cahoots with Crasha Preto and hauling a lot of civilians away. Max can't save Marcelo from being brutally executed by Crasha Preto, but he does save Giovanna, brutally executing Crasha Preto's second in command in the process. Max must now escort Giovanna to safety again, who we discover is pregnant with Raul's child. They wind up with a bus and Max rides shotgun, killing UFA troops gallery style. As their bus trip comes to a close, Max fends off even more troop while Giovanna runs off to be scooped by Raul in his helicopter, who then leave Max behind. De Silva picks up Max and exposes the Panama trip that they were on was a front to launder money for this game's central villain. Victor Bronco. De Silva brings Max to the condemned Imperial Palace Hotel, the headquarters of Crasha Preto, only to discover that they're harvesting organs here from the people taken from the favelas. Victor Bronco oversees this scheme, using the cash to enrich himself and his political ambitions with the help of Becker, who leads the UFA. Max finds the gang's explosive cachet and begins rigging the place. Confronting Crasha Preto leader Alvaro Neves and the roof, Max detonates the charges, giving him a narrow window to dispatch all of them except leader Neves, who is killed by Raul. Raul is returned as a sign of good faith to pick Max up, who forgives him, sending him and Giovanna off to a new life right as he infiltrates UFA's heavily armed headquarters, complete with a confrontation with a death-dealing APC. It's here I had one of those fun sleep on it challenges. You emerge from an elevator to kill a dude, and then barge into the next room to kill a whole bunch of UFA before a heavy shows up. After a long stretch playing this game, this portion stumped me and I died repeatedly. No matter what I did, I was always running low on ammo between my pistol and my machine gun and that heavy put me down every time. I put the game aside for the night and the next day I figured it out. I would start with my pistol, which is great for precision headshots I needed, then when the heavy shows up, I can use my machine gun. I beat it on the first try. Moving on, Max discovers that it was actually UFA's second-in-command Bachmeier who killed Rodrigo, and Max returns the favor. Confronting Becker, Victor shows up to distract Max before Becker tases him and they escape. De Silva takes Max down to the airport to stop Becker and Victor, the former with his own grenade, the latter in his own plane. It's a thrilling conclusion that puts Max on the beach and Victor in a jail cell, who winds up dead within a week for mysterious reasons. Soon, the theme tears, or tears, by noise rock group Health kicks in and we're on our way. Now let's take a moment here to breathe for a second here. Phew. If Max Payne 3 were a game by nearly any other title, I guarantee it would have been better received. The campaign is a whirlwind of sight and sound, and while it's a flawed game, it's a game that takes you places. It never feels like a padded experience, as lardy as the cutscenes can get. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a looker, making the game atmospheric and immersive even in 2020. The game's brief attempts to tie itself back to the original Max Payne games are admirable, but aren't nearly enough for nostalgic fans like myself. For those who are playing the games back to back to back, it's a jarring transition. Now there's one last comparison I want to make here. At the conclusion of each game is a credit roll. I mean, duh, right? Let's look at these. 
The first game finishes at 3 minutes and 20 seconds. Fine. That's just fine. 15 seconds later, the credits for Max Payne 2 end. Okay, you better grab a snack or something because I'm going to hit play. <clears throat> yep. Alrighty. Yep, that's uh, mm -hmm, that guy right there. After 24 minutes, Max Payne 3's credit roll, featuring developers at no fewer than seven Rockstar Studios, comes to an end. Now I realize that times change and all that good stuff. Lots of big AAA releases really dig these lengthy credit sequences just like movies do. As I watched the names go by, I couldn't help but wonder how many of these people actually worked on the game, or if Rockstar was just listing everyone who worked at each studio. Either way, 24 minutes is a really long time. But what of Max? What do we make of him now? Why are you living like this? Like what? You know, scratching around? Sitting in bars all day? Maybe I just haven't found the right guy to put a bullet through my head yet. I just don't know. Max Payne is one of gaming's most famous non-mascot heroes. Or anti-hero, I guess. He doesn't have the bright colors and round shapes of a Mario or Sonic. He doesn't have the Mary Sue sci-fi powers of the Master Chief. And he's definitely not a character that's family friendly but you remember him. Max Payne is defined by his extraordinary combat abilities, his unique interpretation of the world around him, and his unexpressed grief of losing the women closest to him. There doesn't seem to be much beyond that. He can play cards pretty well, he can drive a car, and what else is there? Max Payne is powered by revenge. Sometimes. Most of the time. He's hardly a paragon of virtue, but he knows right from wrong in this crazy gray world he lives in. What motivates him is violence, or the opportunity to produce violence. His wife and daughter are viciously murdered and he's killing every last threat on his way to Nicole Horn. He gets to Horn shortly thereafter, some formalities are settled, and then he's on the beat for two years. There are probably some stories in there, I don't know, I'll never read them. But here comes the sequel. Okay, he marches violently from squeaky clean guys to Vladimir Lem, the dearest of all his friends in short order, and then he's done. Monosex doesn't even exist beyond this point, but then neither do most of the other characters Remedy has created. Without an impetus to use his bullet time skills, without some machine to rage against, Max sits in a bar for years, with the reputation that he's a psycho cop with legendary combat skills, rather than the guy who kinda saves society from shadowy power brokers twice. People know who he is, and they know what he can do, which is probably why he attracts the attention of the Broncos. Max's head is so cloudy at this point that Raul tells him they attended the academy together, and Max immediately falls in line. Me and Passos went to the academy together. Did you? I don't fucking know! Soon he's back to a career of violence. Max doesn't even flinch, he just goes. He's capable of empathy, but love is a distant past for him. He sits on a mountain of sadness and grief, gradually expressing them more and more with bottles of whiskey and beer. When Tony DeMarco hits the woman in the bar, it's no surprise that Max has a bullet in the kid's heart like a reflex. The game literally snaps your reticle to it, and you can't move it a pixel. Less than an hour earlier, he's trying to play himself off as a washed-up has-been to Raul, and now he's back in action like he never left, like he never settled. Never rusted, never grew fat on a couch. He's been waiting for this moment, this opportunity, for years. His campaign through the third game has unfortunate losses. He makes mistakes. He's flawed. He should have shot Becker as soon as he entered that room, but he didn't. God damn it! It doesn't matter too much because he greets the next opportunity to violently track Victor down with enthusiasm and skill. He expresses no hesitation, he just does. He's a Terminator. Max Payne does his job well. I guarantee that if Max Payne 3 hadn't been a commercial disappointment, there would be plenty of fictional parties that would be interested in employing Max skills in however many sequels. When it comes to video gaming, violent invincible killers with special powers are a dime a dozen. There are plenty of nice guys that end up killing lots of people too. But Max Payne has an emotional hook and his performers were excellently cast. Max Payne is portrayed in all three games vocally by actor James McCaffrey. Rockstar opted to model Max Payne after him and mocap his performance for the third game after being portrayed by Sam Lake and Tim Gibbs in the first and second games respectively. McCaffrey brings a gravitas to the character that slots in perfectly with the noir tone that Lake was shooting for. It's hard to imagine any other actor reading these lines. And while it seems out of character for Max to be shouting obscenities at the top of his lungs, he still pulls it off. 
McCaffrey even has a cameo in the 2008 movie. Div. Jack Taliente, special agent, FBI. Who are you? One of Max Payne's trademarks as a death machine was the leather jacket, an omnipresent piece of the Remedy Games' visual real estate that swayed and bent, allowing him to easily maneuver through all of his dives. If Remedy hadn't spent a lot of time and energy making that fabric move in the first game, I'm sure the Metacritic rating would have sunk by like 5 points. It's that important. And for a technical developer like Remedy, I'm sure it was one of their first priorities. It was actually very interesting to see Rockstar save it for the New Jersey sections and leave it behind when he ditches town to experiment with his wardrobe outside of the country. His clothing does seem to find a way to shred itself for dramatic effect though. There are still so many things I could talk about but didn't get to. Health score for the game highlights its tense action thriller pedigree with a sound that's cold and electronic, but not out of the neighborhood from the work of the first two games. Each game offers harder difficulties, but also speedrunning modes. The second game includes a special combat arena where enemies spawn in progressively larger and larger amounts, and it's you, bullet time, and some painkillers to keep you going as long as you can. The third game features a pretty robust multiplayer, a first for the series, and it's pretty fun. But that's not why we're here. The Max Payne trilogy stands apart as a unique, highly refined specimen of action gaming with a protagonist you give a damn about. They just don't make games like these anymore. A modern Max Payne would need an open world with the talent of an extremely gifted writing team to ensure that the emotional tension matches the trigger squeezing bullet timing tension. It would be difficult. Dan Hauser found that out while making his game. Max Payne isn't like any other action star because Remedy imbued him with a real sense of identity. We'll never really figure out who Max Payne is beyond the leather coat, but we know exactly who he is when our finger is on his trigger. This may not have been the first, but it is the nth review. I've been your host, Nick Marsh. If you enjoyed this video, and I assume you did because you're listening to this right now, be sure to like and subscribe and check out any number of nth pops or nth briefly's or nth reviews on tap. And hey, I'll see you next time.